objective here is to look at look over the horizon. I mean, I I look at the the syllabus, and you've had a lot of discussions on various topical themes. Most recently, I think that I heard with regard to illicit flows of of uh, capital and stuff in and out of the continent, and the issues of, of financing for nefarious purposes. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is, is to kind of now, this is time for us to look back and consider where we are standing now and where Africa is now and where it will be at the end of this century. You say, well, that's a long time, you know, but really, not that long. And in the context of the challenges that our national interests face with regard to Africa in the future, you have to look at that. And there's a couple of themes that we all take as self-evident, but I want to iterate them a little bit so that you all understand some of the context of how this may be interpreted from an African perspective as well as, as we engaging Africans in the future. Now, big thing is, is the impact of globalization and intercommunication. And what we've seen is that everything is increasingly connected, but that doesn't mean that things are smoother. When globalization was first coming around and the World Wide Web was being invented, and I do remember it, when it was launched, everyone thought that this would lead to a kind of a homogenization of humanity, that we would find more common aspects to our lives and that we would kind of converge in a common sense of humanity. To a degree that has happened, but it's also what I would say is that it has also kind of accented our diversity. And this cross-cultural interconnectedness has often leads to, free, to friction. And you need to keep that in mind. We as Americans look at the internet and we take it for granted. We look at, the, at, at uh, globalization, we take it for granted until this last election in the States. But there were issues that were attended to it that from an American perspective lent a sense of optimism to the prospects of what this would bring. 9-11 surprised us because of that cross-cultural interconnectedness of which we didn't understand. Right? So globalization did not homogenize humanity, it, it accented its heterogeneity. And the voice of the individual today is louder and broader than ever before. Hyde's Park in London, uh, there's a speaker's corner, and historically it's very famous because you could stand there and you could say whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted, and no one would bother you. They'd walk right by you, but they wouldn't bother And they still do it today. Well, today's Hyde Park speaker's corner is YouTube. YouTube and the distribution of pamphlets to help people pass ideas across. If you go back to the days of the Cold War, Asamista, underground pamphlets, now happens at the speed of an electron. And we also see that change, we always know it's accelerating, but it's also self-compounding. So it's not one thing after the other that's happening, it's that they're happening much closer together and inter-affecting each other in different ways tangents. And Africa's ability to respond to the challenges facing the entire planet will require an urgent and daunting shift in governance and economic policy for Africa, by Africans. And the continent's governments will need to aggressively implement a private sector-led economic growth strategy for a sustained period in order to create jobs for their burgeoning populations. This is the fundamental theme I want to com keep coming back to. And what are those global challenges that are facing Africa? Because they're the same ones that are facing us. But how Africa responds is the issue here. Climate change, population dynamics, urbanization, connected diversity, governance, economics, and technology. I'm going to unpack this, and we can get a sense of where we're, what, what this all means for Africa. And then in the context, what does it mean for our national interests, our security? Because until recently, I'd say in the, I, mean, you know, I, I spent 34 years in the Foreign Service, and I worked 25 years on African issues, and it was good to be out in the hustings. No one bothered you. But Africa and the issues there tend to move, are moving more and more towards the center of our pol foreign policy agenda. Uh, not necessarily because Africa is moving, but because the world is shrinking. You know, there's, oh, President Obama talked about the pivot to Asia. Well, Asia was pivoting to Africa. You know, uh, you got to keep that in mind. But of the global changes that are out there that are looming, of which there's a current and active debate in the United States, there is a growing concern and debate in Africa, climate change. Setting aside the political 
or neo-scientific debate about the role of humans on climate change, the process of climate change is happening. And it is having and beginning to have a global impact. The crisis is estimated on this planet, the crisis will be estimated when the average planetary temperature rises by 3 degrees Celsius compared to the average temperature on the planet of 1900. A 1 1.5 degree rise has already happened. It's inevitable. And the extra half a degree Celsius is pretty much in the books. So 2%, 2 degrees are going to go up from 1900 in terms of Celsius, the temperature of the planet. The hope is to limit that growth just to those two degrees, though the prospects of that aren't clear. No one really knows what the consequences are going to be. Uh, there was a map that came out about five years ago showing the impact of a four degree change, Celsius degree change on the planet's surface temperature. And basically most of North America would be uninhabitable, that people would be living up in northern Canada, hanging out in Greenland, and part of Antarctica. Um, that most of the United States, continental United States, would be a solar field, you know, solar panels and stuff like that. It kind of looked like the Sahel. The consequences of a three degree change by the end of the century are considered by many in the scientific community as simply catastrophic. By some accounts, the planet will be able to sustain one to two billion people at that high, higher temperature. That's what some people are saying. I hope they're wrong. I really, really do. But climate change poses the greatest challenge to Africa because it is the continent that's the most impacted by climate change right now and in the future. And they have the least capability to do anything about it. It's a total exogenous factor for security, development, and growth in Africa. And it has tremendous consequences for the other things that we're going to talk about in terms of the prescriptions for, for improving the conditions in Africa. But as we see now, desertification, rising sea levels, stronger storms will press Africa to develop its agricultural sector as quickly and as sustainable as possible. They have no choice. They have to focus on agriculture. They have to focus on getting Africa green and keeping it green as best they can. And the effects of climate change will displace and or push Africans to cities within and outside of the continent. It's already happening. We'll talk about that too. The other thing about climate change is that the warmer the planet is, it will bring more prospect for disease and pandemic than before. Viruses don't like the cold for some reason. Against this backdrop, you also have population dynamics that the world will reach about 9.3, 9.5, maybe 10 billion people by 2030, 2045, depends on what model you want to look at. Let's say 2050 would be conservative. That's not too far away, 2050, by the way. And there is a view that the population of the planet will stabilize around 10 or 12 billion, what, 10 billion by the end of the century. But this is using that term as economics, and I'm an economist, ceteris paribus, holding all other things equal, which means holding climate change equal. You know, in other words, the circumstances are today, as they are today, the planet will stabilize global population around 10 to 12 billion. It depends on what model you're looking at. Where those people are located will pose a unique challenge for Africa. The developed world will continue to get smaller in relation to the rest of the world. You're already seeing it, okay? The incredible country called Russia that is shrinking, Europe, graying, Japan, graying, the United States population is beginning to stabilize a little bit. The developed world will need to rely on immigration to maintain increasingly constrained social systems, national production, and productivity and domestic markets. In other words, not only will developing countries need to emigrate, but developed countries will need immigrants to keep their economic systems alive and dynamic and growing as their existing previous generations are getting older and less productive. Africa's population is expected to more than double by 2050 to about 2.4 billion people. And it will continue to be the youngest population on the planet with a median age of around 23 years old. The current median age is around 19 and a half, so they're going to get a little older. 
But in relationship to the rest of the world, Africa is going to remain a youthful place, which is kind of ironic since it's the cradle of humanity. And Africa will get younger as the rest of the world, rest, rest of the world gets older. And by 2100, Africa will make up around 48% of the global population of 14-year-olds and under. About half of the tweens and children on the planet will be African by the end of the century, according to current demographic flows. And Africa will also then be juxtaposed to an aging and shrinking Europe. So it's one thing to get younger and older and bigger, but it's another thing to be right next to a place that's getting smaller and older. It's also remembering that Africa is poor and Europe isn't. What analogies? What other place do we know where there's a poor country next to a wealthy country? Let me think. All of these people are going to need jobs. According to the IMF, Africa will need to create this is, you're going to love this, 18 million highly productive jobs per year for the next 20 years to meet the population dividend. That's equivalent to the population of Burkina Faso. They need to create enough jobs for a new Burkina Faso every year for the next 20 years if they're going to meet the population demands for jobs in Africa. When I start talking this way, people get kind of depressed and, you know. <laughs> But it's, these are realities. These are things, these are, you have to manage them. The population dynamics will affect the character and discourse of pan-African politics and relations. In other words, Africans, how they relate to each other is going to change as a result of this. So the Africa that we see today and the interactions that we see today within the African Union are going to be qualitatively different by 2050. By 2050, 28 African countries' populations will double. That's half of the African, there's 54, right? Well, we're not counting... The Western Sahara, right? So 54 countries, and half of them, more than half, will double in population. Okay? By the end of the century, five will have increased their population five times. Ceteris paribus, climate change. For example, by 2050, Nigeria is estimated to become the, most, the third most populous country on the planet after India and China surpassing the United States with over 400 million people. Right now, one in four Africans is a Nigerian. Just saying. That dynamic that goes on, the dialogue between South Africa and Nigeria, is going to get very weird very soon. Urbanization. The global population will be an urban one. This idea of Africa as a rural community, eh, forget that. And city life will be the norm and fewer people will live in rural areas. And Africa, and this is a, that's a global phenomenon. We're all getting cityfied in the future, right? And Africa has some of the highest urbanization rates on the planet right now. You're going to have mega cities in Africa. Right now there's about one or two. You're going to have a bunch in about 20 years. Mega cities are cities of more than 10 million people. And throughout human history, urbanization has had a tremendous impact on the human condition and prosperity. You read that book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and all that, that kind of gives you a sense of what it means. But as an economist, urbanization has a positive factor on economic growth. In other words, I think every, for every one percentage rate of urbanization, that's a two percentage growth in GDP, generally, as a general rule. That does not apply to Africa for some reason. It's less than 1% growth associated with urbanization. People don't understand why. And I think it's because of the lack of infrastructure. And this growth, while positive, is very uneven, which means it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. However, and I have to re reiterate, urbanization in Africa has not generated the economic growth dividend as it has in other parts of the world in previous generations. It hasn't. Some African countries have done better through urbanization, but others have not. And the, as a continent, and when you look at it continentally, and we'll come back to why I'm talking about it continentally versus individual countries, is you have to, if you look at it that way, the, 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 the benefit of urbanization remains to be seen. And urbanization, particularly rapid urbanization, 
results in challenging social, ethnic, and security dynamics for local governance. The impact of urbanization on traditional societies and culture historically has not been good. It's been rather negative. And climate change and the search for employment are already affecting major population movements within and out of Africa. Where are they going? They're going to the cities or they're crossing the Med to get to cities. The European Union is currently struggling with the migration of Africans, among others, there's Syrians and everyone else. And estimates are about 175,000 migrants are crying across the Mediterranean, many of them dying, and this perilous voyage across the Mediterranean. And by the way, it's a cottage industry. I mean, you can, they do like flash mob things to get people to get to the boats and they say, oh, you want water with that Zodiac? Here's an extra fee. You want, oh, you want a, you want a actual boat that floats? That'll cost you a bit more. You know? There's, they, this is all online. There's an estimated 1 million people waiting on the coast of North Africa to cross over into the Mediterranean. 1 million, right now. Now, the EU's challenges, you know, they're scrambling, they don't know what they're going to do. We see all the video, Greece is having problems, Italy, Spain. The EU's challenges pale, pale to the migration popu of populations within Africa. Famine, war, the search for economic opportunity, jobs are pushing and pulling millions around the continent right now. In Gauteng province, this is in South Africa, in that Johannesburg, Erkuleni, Swani corridor, this is where, you know, Johannesburg, Pretoria hang out. That makes up 40% of the GDP of all of South Africa, by the way, right? That megapolis, right, has been absorbing about 225,000 migrants every year for the last decade. Europe is, oh my God, 27 countries, they don't know what they're going to do with 175,000. One part of one province in South Africa is coping with that and more so, more than that. These push-pull factors, particularly those related to the effects of climate change, can result in urbanization without economic growth. We talked about that. And rapidly growing cities are generally unplanned. And they lack the job opportunities for the new arrivals. And unless there's a dramatic shift in economic policy to create jobs, you're going to have some real problems. Because you need government policies to generate jobs, to generate wealth, to increase social spending for basic services. Otherwise, the average African city will be what it is today in the future, but bigger and meaner. And to most African cities today are slums. A slum being a agglomeration of people living in a mass without adequate public services. If you've been to Africa, you know what I'm talking about. You have a really nice area where the wealthy live, a high walls, and you leave that, and then you don't. Connected diversity. The movement of people in the past meant a loss of connection to their places of origin. I remember when I went to Africa my first time in Malawi in the mid-80s, you know, we, we got these things called letters with stamps on them. And my kids were little, you know. Little, little. So we had to get Christmas stuff for them. So we would get the Sears or J.C. Penney catalog and order their Christmas gifts in June, hoping they would arrive by December. If I wanted to make a phone call, I'd have to book it through an operator, and it would cost me eleven and a half dollars a minute. That's how I found out my second son was born because I was waiting online and I was calling on the phone and booking the calls. You know, back in the day, in the past, you know, there was a level of autonomy in terms of the conduct of diplomacy. We kind of told Washington what happened. We didn't ask for permission. But they entrusted us to understand how things were going. He had time to think, to work it through. Long cables were never long cables. We had to type them on a typewriter. You don't want to type cables on a typewriter. It's supposed to be bad. You don't want to do that. Yeah, you got if you do if you make any mistake, you gotta type the whole damn thing over again. Yeah. Um, the technological revolution in communications and, and information systems has completely changed this dynamic, right, of internal and uh, external migration as well. And uh, people expect you to answer things quickly. But there's also something called a butterfly effect, which now occurs at the speed of an electron. Markets, schools, universities, businesses, scientists, governments, and social groups now interact in an increasingly hyperdynamic fashion. 
and uh, coupled with demographic changes occurring around the world, the internet allows for the dispersion and sharing of ideas, both good and bad. Give you a sense of how this can work in a positive way is that you see when the Ebola crisis broke out in West Africa, I was in AFRICOM, I was managing that challenge. Uh, the ability for us to share information quickly uh, in terms of um, infection rates, interventions by public health service, it was amazing. It was facilitated by the, by the internet. Okay. If that crisis had happened 30 years ago, there would have been an outbreak beyond those three countries because the information just couldn't flow fast enough. It would have been like a major quarantine effort. So that's a good thing. On a bad thing, there was a church, there is a church, there's this pastor in Florida. His congregation is about 40 people. About 10 years ago, he decided to, maybe less than that, he decided to burn a Koran in Florida and they videotaped it and it went on, went viral. Now in the old days, before the internet, before YouTube, that story would maybe have gotten, maybe would have gotten two or three lines in a box on a local paper and would have died. Riots in the Muslim world occurred. Our embassies in Khartoum and a few other places were attacked because some cholo idiot pastor in Florida with 48 members decided that he wanted to burn the Quran. Just saying. And people thought that was the United States because that's what they saw on the TV. Just saying. It also creates a demand for nearly instantaneous response. You know, in the back of the good old days, we had letters and stuff. We could think through the problems and engage. Now you can't do that. The, the decision-making cycle has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter to the point that you wonder if there's actually decisions being made or if there's actually any thought involved. Okay? You're having to make quick decisions very fast on less complete information with less reflection than you ever had before. Which means what? Which means to be successful in today's world, you have to be hyperly informed, constantly informed, constantly retrained, constantly aware of what's going on. If you're not, you're not on the vanguard. You're behind. What does that require? It requires education, requires training, requires understanding, requires critical thinking, right? It requires systems, processes by which to, to call the information. This interconnectedness is creating and competing and often conflicting expectations that many African governments see as a threat to their own control. Recently in Cameroon, the government shut down the internet in the English-speaking portion of the country to counter political protests in that region. They did it for about a month, maybe a bit longer. A couple of weeks ago, actually going on right now, I think, the Ethiopian government shut down the internet nationwide to prevent cheating on national school exams with little regard for what that would do to the national economy. <laughs> Businesses couldn't communicate. They, they, you know. Governance. What does this all mean? The demand for better governance is gaining a stronger voice among local communities in Africa and around the world. The technologically savvy individual can now affect political change with little investment. And this means that pluralities can engage majorities in a manner unseen in human history. One person can truly put the world on fire. I mean that in a good way. Urbanization, population dynamics, and interconnectedness suggest that municipal administration will become very important. Mayors. In Africa's rapidly urbanizing youthful population are demanding services and improved accountability from their leaders. In the age of governors and mayors, rather than presidents and prime ministers, may be ascendant, and the ability of national governments to directly manage their citizens may prove more problematic, or shall I say, complex. Who's more powerful in Somalia? The mayor of Mogadishu or the president of Somalia? The president of Somalia. Yeah, the current one, yeah. who lives probably in Detroit. <laughs> All right. Municipal administration and infrastructure will be tested in a fashion unknown in our history. 
The character and quality of urban life will be a factor. The existence of slums co-located to or, uh, or found within established municipalities is already a serious problem, right, for many African societies. And the future will place even greater pressures on African cities to support their growing populations. Youthful populations. Children. And the decentralization and or devolution of governance will be a major factor in, on the African political landscape. If we look at Nigeria in the future, we will see successful Nigerian states developing faster and attracting investment than while other African states flounder. Right? Now, some Nigerian states are already larger in terms of population or wealth than their neighboring West African or Central African neighbors, countries. Lagos State, Lagos State, has 70 million people and a GDP of 91 billion dollars, nominal terms. Benin, an independent sovereign country right next door, has 11 million people and a GDP of 6 billion. What does that mean? Now, Nigeria is a very interesting case. You can get a PhD on this thing because they're the only federal state in Africa. And there, initially, well, there was basically three major provinces in Nigeria, and then you had this war, the Biafran War, which almost rendered Nigeria gone. It was brutal. It was a horrible civil war. But one of the re re results of that war was a federalization of Nigeria that has essentially saved Nigeria. And every time you turn around, there's more and more states. How many are there now? 30 36. Some? 36. There'll probably be a couple more in a few more years. But that's what's happening. But the rest of Africa is a unitary state model. You're seeing a devolution of authority happening in Nigeria. It's uneven, but it's happening. The challenge you see is almost a kind of ex post facto kind of method of these devolution is happening in other parts of Africa, but it's against a unitary state, which suggests what? Political scientists in the room, what does it suggest? Let's think of Cameroon again. Suggests conflict, civil war, quests for national self-determination, autonomy. We saw this in Mali with the Azawad. This is where these guys wanted to have an independent country and they started becoming like a little hood for terrorists. You have the same thing happening in Ethiopia, Romia, Somaliland versus Somalia. God knows if there's Congo is really a country, right? I'm just saying. Now there's economics and technology. And as an economist, I love to talk about this. Sustained economic growth generates wealth, creates prosperity, and reduces poverty. Sustained economic growth has to be homegrown. Has to be homegrown. The economic turnaround in Asia and subsequently in Latin America came from domestic investment. Domestic investment. The split between domestic and foreign investment should be around 80-20. 80 percent of the wealth of a country should be generated, 80 percent of it is from domestic investment, 20 percent comes from FDI. Everyone talks about foreign investors, foreign direct investment, foreign in Africa. No, no. Okay. It's important, but it's not determinative. And FDI, foreign direct investment, may be catalytic, but it is not a driver for sustained economic growth. Never has been. And getting economic policies right that incentivizes domestic investment creates the commercial environment that also attracts FDI. FDI brings that new technology transfer sometimes. FDI brings this catalytic thing that helps lift up the productivity a bit more than what could happen domestically. Okay? But you need to have the conducive environment for that. FDI, if, if you have FDI coming into a country that doesn't have a good economic policy, what you're looking at is a country that is basically extractive. You're looking at Equatorial Guinea, you're looking at Gabon, you're looking at Angola, you're looking at Venezuela. I'm just saying, it's not good, it's not bien. Right? Historically, however, also politically, African governments have not been big boosters for the private sector in their countries. They prefer more of a state-driven model for control. In many African countries, there's a desire for private markets, but not free ones. Ethiopia is the best example. And this is reflected in Africa's abysmally low share of world trade. 
it has hunkered down and has hung around for as long as I can remember to less than 5%. So let's get this straight. Over the past decade or so, some African leaders have espoused a China as an effective alternative to economic, to liberal economic capitalism, kind of a authoritarian or cratic capitalism. I, my view is that generally tends to fall short. As we're seeing, if you're a, study, a student of China, you can see that there's some problems there. And the problem I see is that it, this kind of capitalism fosters a level of cronyism, corruption, and income inequality that is difficult to address. You still have it in liberal economic systems that are bootstrapping, but there's an open political discussion that eventually gets to the root of those issues one way or the other. The elites benefit and poverty tends to persist in these type of autocratic capitalist states. It's even worse when it's just a commodity-driven economy, like oil. Think Angola, think Gabon, think Equatorial Guinea. Ethiopia and Rwanda are often touted as examples of this new model. But are they sustainable? That's the other big word, sustainability. I think not. That's my opinion, though, which means it's worthless. The situation is even worse, I said, when it's commodity-driven. Angola, Mozambique, Algeria, Gabon, the Congos, both of them, Equatorial Guinea are examples of how oil and gas distort economic growth and create serious dysfunction. It's called the rentier state, the Dutch disease, whatever you want to mean. And things are not going well in those countries right now. And to face the demographic challenges of a growing urbanized youth, African governments are going to have to change course in terms of economic policy. No ifs, ands, or buts about this. Liberalization, diversification, and private sector empowerment must be the themes of economic policy if Africa is to prosper. Period. Let me repeat that because I really believe in this stuff. Liberalization, diversification, and private sector empowerment must be the themes of economic policy if Africa is to prosper. And this will not be easy because it's getting harder and harder to uplift an economy. Look, it's, the capital requirements for, are increasing for each successive wave of countries moving from a lesser developed country to a middle developed country. That status is getting harder to achieve. It's getting more expensive to uplift an economy because a greater level of capital is needed, both human, material, and financial. It's just Alexander Gershenkron was talking about this back in the, before the Second World War. And it's true. You, you need more capital to lift up your economy than, you, than the previous generation needed because you have further to go. The technology. Africa, however, has benefited in many respects as they leapfrog technology. You know, Apple Pay? Dude, it was happening in Kenya 15 years ago called M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. And in fact, M-Pesa has contributed, what, 5% to the GDP of Kenya? <laughs> it's some tremendous stuff. Billions are going through the system now in Kenya. And it's also happening in places like the Eastern Congo. Go figure. So what is essential for economic growth? Anybody know? What is essential for economic growth? It's the most important thing in the world, right? We need to have it. Do we know what makes it? Huh? It's one word. Productivity. And increasing productivity. Two words. And productivity of what? There's three things. Yeah, I've been in Europe too long. There's three things. Yeah. <laughs> Labor productivity? Capital productivity? Capital can be land, buildings, money. Capital with a K or capital with a C, which I don't care. And something called total factor productivity, which is all the stuff we don't know what it's about. But basically, innovation. I'll give you an example. I give you a computer. You a computer. You've never seen one before. You start using it as a typewriter, like I did. All right? Then after a while, though, it's computing power you begin to manipulate and utilize to make it, at your accounting as a bookkeeper easier, tracking inventory easier. But that's you utilizing this new technology. That's your innovation. That's your increase in productivity. And that computer has become more productive as a piece of capital because it's no longer being used as a typewriter. 
Okay. But how does one increase productivity? How does one improve labor productivity, capital productivity, and this thing called total factor productivity, innovation? Well, education tied to innovation is an important element. A dynamic private sector is also a driver for innovation, making a widget better, faster, cheaper. African governments have made gains in literacy and numeracy rates over the past 20 years, but these have been gains in basic education. And the same cannot be said for technical or university education in Africa. There are more African universities, but they suck. In Cote d'Ivoire, I think when kids going to university, they were going to the University of Fine Arts, learning photography. They had never, they got a degree, they had never held a camera. I have people who study chemistry in university in Abidjan who've never been in a laboratory. Everything's by book. They learned everything in the book. Engineering, same way. Would you want that person to build your bridge? quality of education in Africa is, shall we say, mixed and has to be improved. Technological innovation has spurred productivity around the world, particularly in manufacturing, right? However, for the next, we're talking about the next century, this century, right? The gains in manufacturing productivity have started to realize a drop in global manufacturing employment. Let me repeat that. The gains in manufacturing productivity have started to realize a drop in global manufacturing employment. Manufacturing jobs are shrinking. Why? Automation. Robots. There, there's some reports that all of our jobs will be all out of a job in about 20 years because of robots. Please, take my job. <laughs> it's going to dramatically change the employment landscape around the world. In the United States, you know, there was this whole thing during the campaign about, you know, all these jobs lost to imports and China and NAFTA and all that. Ball State University did a study not too long ago that's, that looked at the impact of manufacturing job loss in the United States from 1991. Why 1991? That's the year that NAFTA was implemented and that's the year, date, that's the year that China went into the WTO. Of the 400,000 jobs lost out of a labor pool of 150 million, that scale alone should tell you that this is a false issue. 400,000 jobs, 150 million workers. 400,000 jobs lost, 150 million workers. That's in itself bad. But of the 400,000 jobs that were lost from 1991 to 2015, 15% were lost to imports. 85% were lost to automation. And the trend of automation taking over jobs is incredible. Right now, if, I don't know if you follow these, these you know, on Facebook and LinkedIn, I got all these cool things. That, they have now come out with a computer, a 3D printer, that makes other 3D printers. <laughs> and improves them through deep learning. We are going to be in a weird place very soon. The issue of artificial intelligence, robotics, I'm just saying Skynet. By some accounts, automation and artificial intelligence will replace 48% of all current jobs in modern economies within the next 50 years, if not sooner. 48%. It includes doctors, lawyers, <laughs> right? Teachers. It's already happening. There was a Watson, you ever heard of Watson? Watson's the IBM computer. Five years ago, I think, they trained, or two years ago, three years ago, they trained it to look at the issue of thoracic cancers. And they, what they did is they said, okay, search the web, get all the information you can, and the computer through, gave it a couple of good algorithms to learn. It's called deep learning, which means the algorithm teaches itself to create new algorithms so it can learn better. And now Watson is, is better at diagnosing in advance the signs for thoracic cancer better than the top leading four thoracic oncologists on the planet. To the point now that they're using what Watson has done to figure out ways of diagnosing cancers earlier than before. What a great benefit for humanity. Google, Translate, developed a new algorithm and they taught this algorithm how to speak four or five French words 
and told it overnight, look at the web and come back. And they came back the next day and the program was fluent mm -hmm. in French. You're now getting to the point now that the automation is so fast that you're going to, remember the Star Trek, the Universal Translator? That's almost now. So they figure a couple years. That's going to be really wicked in terms of commun inter intercultural communication. The world moved from agriculture to industry in the early 20th century, right? 19th century, 20th century. In the first half of the 21st century, it is moving from manufacturing to services, and this poses a unique challenge for developing countries. Everyone wants to go to manufacturing because it's going to create jobs. But modern-day manufacturing creates fewer jobs. So you need more capital. You see this cycle I'm getting into? What are they going to do? So the question is, can modern manufacturing in Africa create the jobs necessary to satisfy labor demand, which is around 18 million jobs per year? And technical, technological innovation is increasing at an ever-accelerating rate, and those societies that host this innovation, those that are on, they will be on the vanguard and their prosperity will increase. So you've got to jump in front. You've got to leapfrog in front. African countries have the ability to do that because they don't have the burden, the legacy of the infrastructure that we have. But I don't see a lot of people investing in Africa to do that. There are some examples. Uh, German companies, uh, manufacturing companies, are investing in Algeria and other places for production of BMWs or Mercedes or airplanes because the productivity is there. And it's better, like in the United States, the Machiadora process. Have you ever studied that? What happened with NAFTA? We had these companies that were manufacturing stuff, assembling stuff on the border in the United States using American inputs. And they had cheap labor. They were called maquiladoras, right? Factories. What has happened now is because of NAFTA, the complex supply chain thing is that any product that's made in the United States, like a car or something like that, a lot of times, it crosses the Canadian-American border like six times. So the pieces are moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The maquiladoras don't exist like they used to anymore. They've now become these very tailored, highly technical facilities. And it's in Canada and the United States. So if you want, you know, if you want to close a close trade or do something, you're going to affect basic production in North America. That's a model for Africa and Europe, I'm just saying. Now, those are the big themes. There's a lot of other stuff you can talk about. The average young woman, average girl who's born today in Zimbabwe, will, if she's lucky, will live, current lifespan is about 48 years. The same girl born in Japan will live to about 120. I'm not talking about things like nanotechnologies. I'm not talking about the changes in warfare. I'm not talking about the changes in all kind of cool things. But it's, where's Africa going to be in all of that? So you have to ask yourself, what does it mean for us? You know, what is and see, societies are going to have to change. They're going to have to be on the vanguard. And I'm I said the word societies, not countries, not governments. Because in many respects, wealth and income distribution has become more unequal around the world, and in the United States, for example. That was one of the factors driving our last political campaign. And some reflect that a new gilded age, similar to the gilded age of the 19th century, may be looming. I don't want to live in that age. You want to live in that age? Read books like by Upton Sinclair, stuff like that. That shows you what it was like. And this should give us some pause, because it, uh, that gilded age fostered tremendous and significant social upheaval and polarization in the United States. And we were like on the cutting edge of development at the time. What does that do for countries that don't have the same wherewithal? What does that mean for us who engage these countries? An burgeoning youthful African population offers tremendous opportunities for growth and commercial activity that can bolster the prosperity of the developed world while at the same time bringing prosperity to themselves. The youth of Africa can support and sustain the prosperity of the developed world if they're marshaled and utilized effectively, while at the same time uplifting their own societies. That can be done. It can be done. It's been done before. It's been done in Africa before. Countries that had no natural resources bootstrapped themselves within 15 years and went from being incredibly poor to now middle income. They don't even qualify for world bank loans. It's Mauritius and Cape Verde. You know, if they can do it, why can't others do it? It's all about policy. 
Industry will need to extend its processes into Africa to take advantage of what will be the largest labor pool in 2050. The largest labor pool on the planet will be in Africa. <laughs> Go figure, huh? And that's why I think like the NAFTA and the Macchiadotta process, the evolution of that is a good thing to look at in terms of how can one apply that to Africa. The drivers for economic growth and prosperity in Africa are also the drivers for social conflict, extremism, war, and revolution. They're exactly the same things. Youth, urbanization, climate change, innovation, interconnectedness. And governance, democratic governance in my opinion, will be the key to place African governments on a virtuous, positively reinforcing path. Poor governance will tip the balance to a vicious cycle of poverty and violence. Now, Africa is made up of 54 countries right now. And I think it's unrealistic that each will meet the challenges of the second part of the century. But how will state failure affect successful neighbors? Will the pressures of the future compel Pan-African solutions? Or will governance devolve from national authorities to something smaller? These are questions we have to think about. Good governance and locally driven development rather than donor driven development will need our support. It sounds like I'm speaking kind of like a tautology right here, a little weirdness. Yeah, it isn't. The decisions are made in Africa, not in Washington, not in Brussels, not in Berlin, not in London, not in Beijing. They're made in Africa. And we have to support the locals doing what they need to lift their economies up. Not, you know, pay consultants in Washington, D.C. And as an international consultant, it's okay with me. I don't do government contracts. You cannot have sustainable security without development. And you need security, some security, for development to occur. It's like an, it's like an identity. It's, it's more than an equ it's equation. It's a reality. Can we de-emphasize our security-driven focus right now to meet this requirement? Right now, we're just leaning over, you know, whack-a-mole, CT stuff, man. That's what we're going to do. We're going to kill out. We're going to get all the terrorists. By the way, terrorism has been around since humans have been around. So I don't know about that. And the technolo technological innovations of the next century, next half century, of, will be the stuff of science fiction. I've already alluded to it in terms of transportation, medicine, robotics nanotechnologies, artificial intelligence. And by the end of the century, humanity will be an interplanetary species. We'll have people living on Mars. At the same time, we're polluting our planet. So as the developed world gets ready to go to Mars while we're trashing out our planet, where will Africans sit? And how will the benefits of this brave new world be distributed? And will Africa be able to leap ahead to keep abreast of these looming global challenges and how can we help them. There's a sense of urgency here, folks. The continent is currently facing one of its most complex times in its history. It's unprecedented what's happening there right now. Populations are moving from crisis, political or natural, for economic opportunity, more than ever before. While hundreds of thousands are seeking foreign shores, millions are moving within the continent. There's conflict in my, my lifetime. I've never seen this before. There is conflict in every region in Africa. North, south, central, east, and west. In the past, it was just southern Africa that was burning. In the past, it was just west Africa that was burning. Central Africa, well. Now you have conflict in all five quadrants. Well, it's, not, it's not a quadrant if it's five. I don't know what it means. Globalization is accelerating in Africa, particularly among the youth. And Africa's youth is gaining, is growing, it, their voice is growing in a manner unheard of, even during the continent's independence movements of the 20th century. African youth have largely been silent. It's been their leadership, the traditional role. That's, that's changing. And after the democratic gains of the past 15 years, there is now a democratic recession going on on the continent. Just as the cities are booming, and the citizens are demanding more services from their mayors. 
there is a re democratic recession on the continent right now. It is a certainty that Africa will have the largest labor pool on the planet within a decade, but it is far from certain that the continent will be able to attract the capital to educate, train, or otherwise develop this labor market. And like I said, there are two models, liberal capitalism, authoritarian directed capitalism. They're juxtaposed. Look at Kenya and Ethiopia. Commodity-based economics is a dead-end street. Boom and bust, whatever you want to call it. And this is a thing that's recognized in most African governments, and they are scrambling, the smart ones anyway, are scrambling to find ways to diversify into agriculture and manufacturing. They need energy. They need a lot of it. It's a constraint to growth. You need the juice to make things work. And all of this is happening right now. <laughs> right now. And now is the time for a forceful engagement to help our African partners shift their economic, commercial, and social policies to affect dramatic change. So I would suggest that you know we're looking at over the horizon, that African horizon is fast approaching. And uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you.